Hello everyone, uh, my name is Oliva and I'll be your host for today. Um, I'm the re representative from the publisher and I have processed this book. Um, welcome and thank you for taking part in MDPI's book launch um, on the edition Self-Representation in an Expanded Field, From Self-Portraiture to Selfie, Contemporary Art in the Social Media Age. Book launch is our new service from MDPI Books and is now kicked off with this edition by Ace Lena. The book is part of the series called State of the Arts, Reflecting Contemporary Cultural Expression. If you're interested in contributing to this topic, you can submit your book proposal to MDPI Books. Simply visit our website for more information. I would like to remind everyone also that this web webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available as soon as possible on the book's webpage, as well as on SciForum and on YouTube. Today's session is also being live streamed on MDPI Books YouTube channel, so hello to those of you watching us from there. Um, and today's book launch is chaired by Professor Ace Lehner. Ace Lehner is an interdisciplinary scholar and artist specializing in critical engagement with identity and representation, history, theory and criticism of contemporary art, photography theory, queer and trans theory, as well as critical race studies. Recently, Lena has presented the research at the College Art Association Conference, Rochester Institute of Technology and the International Center of Photography. They've been published in the art journal Refract, the Wattis Institute for Contemporary Art, and the journal on images and culture. The work has been ex exhibited internationally, internationally and has recently appeared at El Museo del Barrio in New York in collaboration with artist Libby Paloma and Lena's project, Barbershop, the, queer, the Art of Queer Failure, will be featured in a solo exhibition at Practice Gallery in Philadelphia in 2021. Lena holds a PhD in visual, visual studies from the University of California at Santa Cruz and MFA in Fine Arts from California College of the Arts. And Lena is based in New York and teaches at Parsons College, uh, School of Design, the Fashion Institute of Technology and the International Center of Photography. Lena is also available for consultation and speaking engagements related to queer and trans inclusivity. Thank you, Ace, for chairing today's book launch. Um, there will also be five presentations today of five minutes each given by Natalie Zelt, Tina Sauerländer, Mark Tassmann, Mehita Ikani, and Ace Lena at the end. The presentations will be followed by a discussion and Q&A session moderated by the chair. If you have any questions for our speakers, please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Please remember to mention the name of the person to whom you're addressing your question to. If you, if you want to ask your question yourself, you can also raise your virtual hand and I will hand you the mic. So last but not least, thank you all to all the authors of the edition we're attending today, as well as the others who have brought this volume to fruition. It has been a true pleasure working with all of you. And that's it from me. And now I will hand over the mic to our chair. I hope you all enjoy today's book launch. Thank you, Oliver, for the excellent uh, introduction to the project and for working with all of us. Um, and welcome to everyone, uh, to our panelists, to everyone who's watching and listening uh, from around the world. It's really exciting. Um, and I wanted to say, you know, especially in these uh, trying and tumultuous times, uh, I really appreciate everyone's support of this project. Um, and that being said, I find this book to be an important intervention into scholarly discourse and creative practices, um, not only uh, for the argument uh, that all self-representations be considered in an expanded field, um, but due to the diversity of approaches, perspectives, and culture producers that are included in this book. I'm really pleased how diverse this book is. Um, and really, you know, given the global unrest that we're facing today due to racism, settler colonialism, and capitalism, I really feel pleased that we are also pushing culture forward with this conversation. Um, so I truly see everybody's work as a, a timely and important intervention into the field and study of discourses and self-representation. So thank you to all the contributors uh, in particular. Um, I, I really mean that. And I wanted to be sure to give a special thanks to, to the editorial team at ND, MDPI, uh, Oliva, Laura Wagner, as well as everyone else, um, the peer reviewers, um, which really were instrumental in making these chapters super strong. 
Um, and I'm immensely thankful to all of the amazing contributors whose brilliance has really been instrumental in making this book a timely intervention into discourses of self-representation, selfies, social media, self-portraiture, and beyond. So thank you everybody so, 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 so much. Um, a little bit about the overview of the project just quickly, and then um, I'll introduce everyone to today's uh, presenters. So uh, due in large part to the advent of the selfie, self-imaging has become a defining factor of globally networked contemporary life, defined as a self-image made with a handheld mobile device and shared via social media platforms. The popularity of online users sharing selfies on social media sites, such as Facebook, Tumblr, and Instagram, led Oxford dictionaries to proclaim selfie as its 2013 word of the year. And since then, there has been a continued proliferation of self-imaging and great popular and intellectual interest in selfies. Not only are they a ubiquitous part of contemporary life, Selfies are a complex form of social interaction and emerging aesthetic, and they're having an irrevocable impact on self-portraiture. So a little about self-portraiture. In its very definition, self-portraiture is both really specific and also amorphous. It's a representation, a production, and a creation of someone made by that same individual. But the specifics of how and why are a little bit unarticulated. The advent of the selfie has highlighted this problematic politics and this fickle definition. So for example, Miriam Webster's dictionary defines a self-portrait as a portrait of oneself done by oneself, while Oxford Dictionary defines self-portrait as a portrait of an artist produced or created by that artist. So what a self-portrait is and what its aims are really remain up to the maker. And the distinction about who is authorized to create a self-portrait, is it oneself or is it the artist, is really at the core of the contention around self-portraits and selfies. So the question of whose self-portraits have been considered legitimate, along with the expected aesthetics and artistic intent of self-representation has really remained constant points of contention throughout art history. Um, scholarly discourse around selfies has moved these contentions to the fore, right? So discussions around selfies have really highlighted uh, this kind of fickle definition and the, the hierarchy of it. So by a, a diversity of interdisciplinary approaches, the chapters gathered herein reveal that in our current moment, it's necessary and advantageous to consider the merits and interventions of selfies and self-portraiture in an expanded field of self-representation. So that's a, a little teaser of what I write about in the introduction and what you're gonna get today. Um, so let me introduce our presenters. Uh, so Mejita Ikani, author of the chapter entitled First Ever Selfie Cover, Cosmopolitan Magazine Influencers and the 161 Mainstreaming of Selfie Style, as a professor in the Media Studies Department at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. Her research is interdisciplinary, spanning the politics of waste, consumption and inequity, cultural theory, critical discourse analysis, and strategic communications. She is the author of three monographs, most recently, Garbage in Popular Culture, Consumption, and the Aesthetics of Waste. She is the co-editor of, of four collections, most recently, Media Studies, Critical African and Decolonial Approaches, and African Luxury, Aesthetics and Politics. She has also published widely in reviews for key international journals, is associate editor of Consumptions, Markets, and Culture, and is on the board of the International Journal of Cultural Studies and Communication Theory. Her PhD is in Media and Communications from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Welcome, Nikita. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, our next presenter today is author of Reflecting on Life on the Internet, artistic webcam performances from 1997 to 2017 and is Tina Saralander. 
She is an art historian, curator, speaker, and writer. She focuses on the impact of the digital, of, of the digital and internet on individual environments and society, as well as on virtual reality and visual arts. She is a PhD candidate at University of Art and Design Linz, Austria, Department of Interface Cultures. Her research topic is artistic self-representations in digital art. She's the director and head curator of the independent exhibition platform, Peer to Space, and has been curating and organizing international group so shows since, since 2010, including the Unframed World, Virtual Reality as Artistic Medium for the 21st Century, she is co-founder of Radiance VR, an international online research platform for VR experiences and visual arts. And she has given talks on virtual reality and art at Republika in Berlin, ZKM Karlsruhe, excuse me for my bad pronunciation, um, and New Inc. in New York. She is the author of comprehensive texts on contemporary artists, including Terence Simon, Alicia Quade, Gregor Hildebrandt, Carson Nikolai, uh, and many others. She is the founder of The Saloon, a diverse network of women identifying art professionals active in a growing number of cities worldwide. And she is also artistic director of the VR Art Prize by DKB in cooperation with CAA Berlin. Thank you, Tina, for your excellent chapter and for being with us today. Uh, next up, we've got Mark Tasman, who wrote the chapter Race for the Prize, the Proto-Selfie as Endurance Performance Art. Mark is an intermedia artist focusing his research creation on the strengths of social technologies to create meaning and culture. He is currently a senior lecturer at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in journalism, advertising, and media studies, where he directs the interdisciplinary digital arts and culture program. Tasman encourages students to look at theories of media and to test them using various innovative, engaging, and practical applications in classes such as internet culture, media graphics, and photojournalism. He may be most well known as the 12-year-old computer genius from 1984 on YouTube or from his project 10 years and one day in which he photographed himself at least once a day, every day for 3,654 consecutive days from July 24th, 1999 through July 24th, 2009, using a Polaroid camera and film. Tasman has presented and exhibited throughout the US in Canada and Europe, screening work at the Ann Arbor Film Festival and published photographs in the New York Times Digital Edition, the Huffington Post, Mother Jones, and Tablet. Welcome, Mark. Thank you so much for your excellent chapter, for being here today. What a pleasure. Uh, and last but not least, only due to the alphabet, uh, author of Feeling Myself, Loving Gestures and Representation in Micheline Thomas's Muse is Natalie Zelt, who is a specialist in the history of art of the United States with a focus on photography and critical race and gender studies. She earned her doctorate at the University of Texas, Austin. Zelt has worked independently as a curator for more than a decade, as a founding member of the anti-racist feminist collective INGZ, and has worked for institutions such as the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. She is the author of several articles on photography and identity in the United States, and her manuscript, Looking and Looking Back, The Photography of Blackness, Family, and Self-Representation in the Work of Latoya Ruby Fraser, Micheline Thomas, and Nyaja Akunyili Crosby is in development for publication. She is the Terra Foundation Postdoctoral Fellow in American Photography at the Ricks Museum, and she currently lives and works in Amsterdam. So welcome, Natalie. Thank you so much for your work and for joining us today. Um, I wanted quickly also to thank other chapter contributors who are unable to present today for their excellent work. Um, special thank you to Sita for your chapter Between Ourselves, 
conversations on race and representation, your thoughtful, heartfelt, and compelling discussion and interviews on this topic of creativity, intersectionality, creative practice, representation, and education is brilliant and really moving. Uh, thank you, Ramon, for the fascinating take on cello tape selfies and practices of self-defacement in your chapter, Selfie Wars on social media. And uh, finally, uh, thank you so much, Rudy, for your curatorial essay on the timely and compelling exhibition from self to selfie and introduction and the inclusion of so many amazing artists and the great uh, cover image uh, courtesy of Boy Child. So thank you to everyone so much for being here. Round of applause to y'all. Um, and now I will turn it over to our uh, first uh, presenter, Natalie Welt. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here today and have something to celebrate. Um, I'm honored to be part of this urgent and thoughtful conversation. Um, and again, delighted to celebrate ACE's hard work, the hard work of all the contributors, um, Oliva and all the folks at MDPI Press who have worked really hard during really hard times to make this book a reality. The chapter I contributed to self-representation in an expanded field moves through a solo exhibition of photographs by US-based artist Micheline Thomas. The exhibition was called Muse um, and it took place at Aperture Foundation Gallery in New York in the early days of 2016. What you're seeing in this first slides here is the gold title wall that greeted visitors as they entered the gallery. And then uh, directly across that sight line there is a wall of um, photographs by Thomas of varying sizes. And then there's a, a series of gray walls um, that include images by Xaviera Simmons on the one side and Carrie Mae Weems on the other, um, notably not Micheline Thomas, right? So um, those were part of an exhibition within this exhibition um, that was curated by Thomas and placed within the solo exhibition. She titled it Tete a Tete. If you were to walk through the space opened up between those Simmons and Williams photographs, you would find what you see to the right here, which includes more examples from Tete a Tete, um, a, a large wood framed Renee Cox photograph um, on one of those yellow wallpaper walls, and then across um, a large Deanna Lawson photograph. And each of these flank um, a living room installation. So complete with wood paneling, furniture, mirrors, um, faux foliage, and photographs by Thomas. And at the heart of this installation, in the heart of this exhibition, is the center of my chapter, which is a diptych, a photographic diptych called Madame Mama Bush and Afro Goddess with Hand Between Legs. Um, and these sort of images get you a little closer to their position within this exhibition. Muse is fascinating for many reasons. Um, it represents a major shift for Aperture, which is significant because of the foundation's role in forming the history of the medium in the United States. It's a shift in thinking more expansively about what counts in the boundaries of medium specificity, and also for whose artwork holds place in the history that Aperture um, writes through its programming. Presenting a solo exhibition of artwork by a queer Black artist identifying as a woman who pictures Black female subjects is itself historic for Aperture. An installation of a domestic interior creating literal and metaphorical living room within the walls of Aperture Gallery and the setting of a photography exhibition is also a major shift. But the nature of this solo exhibition and the way that Thomas approached this solo opportunity pushes the limits of convention also. It tilts an opportunity that is usually cast by zero sum stakes by stressing relationality and reference and community in many layered ways. And in this chapter, I approach the study of relationality and reference in self portraiture through two key lenses, the notion of divahood or diva relations as theorized by poet and cultural historian, Deborah Paredes, and of self-love as framed in Black feminist love politics outlined by historian Jennifer Nash. Both lenses help me move through what Derek Conrad Murray calls McLean Thomas's conceptual relentlessness to analyze the connection between articulations of a self as both individual and collective in Thomas's photographs. These are the photographs, the diptych images closer. One is a self-portrait of Thomas on the blue and white 
backdrop. The other is a portrait Thomas made of her mother, Sandra Bush. Both are sensual, gentle, loving, and advance what Murray has also called a queer feminist desiring gaze and the power of the look. But in this chapter, I'm interested in when it meant for them to be placed together, to be paired, to be coupled into a single artwork. And that togetherness is central to the concept of diva relations in which artists gain a deeper understanding of their individual power only through a relationship to other divas or virtuosas. The articulation of individual pleasure and power through togetherness is also central to black feminist love politics in which self-love, both in terms of bodily pleasure and care is a transformative labor rooted in commitment to each other. By looking at Madame Mama Bush and Afro goddess with hand between legs, the divahood and love with divahood and love politics in mind, we extend the theorizations of the ways Thomas's art and self portraiture challenge representational tropes of black women in Western art, showing that through her photographs and portraiture, Thomas enacts visual and medium specific critiques alongside articulations of love, care and community. Thank you. Sorry for the technical disrupt. On to Tina. Yeah, well, also from my side, thank you so much, Ace Lena. Thank you so much, MDPI Books and Oliver, for your hard work you're putting in this book and for having me um, within it. Thank you so much. So um, my essay, Reflecting uh, on Live on the Internet, Artistic Webcam Performances from 1997 to 2017, introduces webcam-based artworks by the artists Anna Vogue, Isaac Leung, Ann Hirsch, Kate Durbin, Petra Cotred, and Molly Soda. Uh, it aims to give an overview of the different artistic uses of the webcam. The webcam was brought, um, uh, or the webcam brought images to a very text-based internet in 1994, and it enabled its users to broadcast images to a predefined website in real time, in a stream consisting of maybe one image per every three seconds, people could stream their surroundings directly to the internet. For example, whether live games uh, became popular back then. And Anna Vogue and Isaac Leung are representatives of these early days of the internet. With Anna Cam, the artist Anna Vogue broadcasted herself 24 seven to the internet from 1997 on for 12 years. She, and she streamed her daily activities such as cooking dinner, vacuuming, having sex, chatting with camp watchers and hosting visitors. Isaac Leung used the webcam as a core tool for his artistic research of interpersonal sexual interaction on a chat platform. His project, The Impossibility of Having Sex with 500 Men in a Month, I'm an Oriental Whore from 2003, is a cybersexual exploration which documents a month long marathon of online sexual encounters. And here on the first image, we see um, um, still of Petra Cotwright's webcam performance, where she records herself staring at her computer screen and testing the various default visual effects of her webcam, like animated pizza slices, flowers, cats, etc. And while uploading the video to YouTube, Cotwright adds meta metadata tags like tits, vagina, sex, nude boobs, and so on. So tags that are usually pull a higher ranking in search engines for spam or porn. So she uses a phenomenon that since then ha had been widely commercially appropriated and is known as clickbait. On um, the second image, uh, uh, we see um, the performance uh, still of uh, Scandalicious by the artist Anne Hirsch, who performed the persona Caroline, a self-described 18-year-old college freshman who danced for the camera, vlogged and interacted with her followers. In her performance, Hirsch addresses several archetypes of cam girls that had emerged during the first decade of the webcam, especially girls coming from the bedroom. On the third image, uh, we see a uh, cloud nine where the artist Kate Durbin performs as a cam girl on cam four, an online sex cam platform. For almost two hours, the artist engaged with her viewers and asked her audience to tell her the craziest things they have ever done for money. Durban engages the viewers in a conversation about the often precarious living conditions of female artists, forcing them to compromise their beliefs and bodies to generate money to live. Um, the video, sorry. 
The video, Who Sorry Now by Molly Soda, shows the artist from the webcam perspective of a laptop sitting on on a um, bed in a room and crying in the dark, her face only illuminated by the dim glow of the screen. Similar to Anna Vogue, Molly Soda's work is perceived as very personal and authentic. Soda has committed to publicly extending her IRL self, which she performs and exposes on different platforms. Um, yeah, after introducing the artworks, my essay discusses the common features, artistic motives, the understandings of online identities, the notions of online interaction, the principle of oversharing, and the parameters of censorship, taking the changes of the Web 2.0 into account that, for example, also enabled the higher definition and smoother streaming and made the rise of social media platforms possible which of course changed the role and land, uh, which of course changed the whole landscape and notion of webcam artists. Um, I cannot go into details here, but I want to conclude with two aspects. All artists mention, explore and reflect on live on the internet and establish a discourse on social norms. Vogue and Leung address social taboos in regard to nudity and sex. And the next generation of webcam artists like Courtright, Hirsch, Durbin or Soda are interested in exploring different forms of online identities on different platforms, their audiences and the validity of social norms on the internet. Today, a wide variety of artists using webcams for their work engage on and with social media. They disseminate their art on the internet and interact more directly with their audience. They are able to bypass the conventional art economy system consisting of galleries and museums by selling their work directly to collectors and be seen by their online communities. Thanks to the webcam and the internet, artists break with hierarchies of art and culture, create and shape their own public image and narrative. They reach an audience with the need, without the need to bend and buckle to fulfill the norms of the offline art world to be seen and appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I will share my screen. I'm Mark Tasman. Um, thank you um, to ACE uh, for organizing this for uh, Oliva and the people at M. DPI Press and um, all the con contributors. This is uh, exciting. Um, I, I, you know, Ace, I wanted to also um, just thank you for supporting um, this notion of uh, disciplinary inclusivity, um, which I think is um, uh, important, uh, as you said, in 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 our uh, kind of uh, changing uh, changing worldscape. Um, so here I'll just um, briefly and informally um, introduce and, and kind of tease um, the chapter, Race for the Prize, Proto Selfie as Endurance Performance Art. Um, I will say that this, um, this group of four artists here, myself included here, these are um, artists who all started uh, making uh, daily self-portraits around the same time within uh, months of one another in the um, just a, around the, the turn of the millennium, if people remember that, um, we called it Y2K. Um, and so look, uh, so the, the chapter looks at these, these um, four artists, on one hand, as a kind of missing link uh, between the, um, the, the avant-garde um, performative projects um, of artists using their bodies, artists like um, Carly Schneeman and uh, Luca Samaris, uh, Marina uh, Bramovich um, and uh, Lucas Samaris, um, uh, modernist, postmodernist, uh, that epic between uh, uh, the late 60s, uh, 70s and 80s. Uh, and um, this, um, uh, you, you know the 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 social media and self portrait phenomenon that we know as the vernacular selfie. Um, so in it, and uh, the thing, one of the things that I'm most proud of are the um, the interviews and firsthand accounts uh, that I've collected from um, from 
fellow artists um, here. Some of them include um, Intrigue, uh, uh, Spycraft, um, Larceny, <laughs> um, but um, it, mostly Race for the Prize, um, which is a uh, 1999 song by the Flaming Lips. Um, and uh, the, the paper in general is, is meant to uh, convey or communicate or capture a zeitgeist um, of, this, of this time. Um, uh, and and the, um, really the, the influences, um, both uh, conceptual and technical, um, uh, of of these these um, the artists and and these these projects, um, I th I think what's what's notable here is that um, um, first of all, there's a kind of um, uh, a remediation happening um, of of you know as artists adapt to the um, the technology that's that's possible. Um, all, all of uh, all of us, um, these four artists, went to art school in the 1990s. So um, those particular um, influences of uh, the photographers who were using their their bodies um, as subjects uh, were all prevalent. Um, um, but but in these interviews, um, I, I kind of uncover some some other um, uh, more popular culture. Influences Noah Kalina, for example, um, was captivated by um, the Harvey Keitel film uh, *Smoke*, uh, in which a, a, um, a cigar shop owner photographs on the street corner every morning um, at the same time. Um, Ari Lee has um, a, a great uh, story also about um, her interactions with YouTube. In, in the early days, um, because she was she was the first to take the this kind of body of um, self portraits that she was um, accumulating and turn it into a a video. Um, it, it was uh, kind of put out on YouTube without her permission. And when Noah saw that, he was like, "Great idea!" And everybody was like, "Hey, Noah, did you see this?" And so it it thrust um, suddenly it thrust all of us who were kind of operating in um, a, a obscurity or isolation into a kind of um, recognition um, of each other and a, um, you know, in some sense, a competitive uh, community, but one that um, uh, pushed us forward um, in um, unusual ways. And I will say that the, the theme, um, you know, one more theme that, um, is in the um, in this article that that ties it together and connects it to um, the the kind of broader art historical discourses of self portraiture is um, the principle of memento mori, which is that we have a um, that we're mortal and we have a temporary um, uh, our spirits have temporary homes. Um, in our bodies, and so that the the essential gesture um, for for most of these works is the the kind of uh, what I call the death grimace, as time uh, um, as as we understand that we are um, in friction um, with time, um, and that the um, the the um, the selfie and and our use of that I think is an important. Um, reconciliation with new technologies and as we um, you know as we we continue our struggles um, uh, in the world for um, self-expression um, you know uh, personal autonomy and uh, and uh, human rights thank you so I think it's my turn now shall I just go ahead and get started <laughs> So I'd like to echo all of my uh, co-panelists. Um, thanks and praise to Ace and the team at MDPI. It's so great to be a part of this panel and this book. Um, so the chapter that I wrote um, that I contributed is quite a, a straightforward analysis of one commercial 
image, um, which I'm going to show you now. Quite a, as you can see, just, just one image that I wrote about. So as you can see, this is the cover of Cosmopolitan South Africa magazine from uh, February 2019. And I was really struck by this cover because it seemed to try to marry the genres of the of the glossy magazine cover with the power of social media and as you can tell from the call out lines on um, the front of the magazine this um, issue was framed as the influencer issue and what the editor did was choose three uh, highly like, visible and, and successful South African women influencers and brought them into the studio and created this image which they claimed was a selfie and in their own publicity for this issue of the magazine, Cosmopolitan called it the first ever selfie cover, right? So I was really interested in both the aesthetics and the politics of this image. And that's what I explore and write about uh, in as much detail as I could get into in the chapter. Anyway, so just a little bit of context about Cosmo South Africa. Um, it actually no longer is published. It, it um, closed down the, the publishing company that published it and a range of other commercial titles closed down in uh, March last year. And they said that it was as a result of the pandemic and the massive economic slump that happened in South Africa because of the lockdown. Um, I suspect there's a more to that story. Um, I'm not privy to all of the details, but I think it's also an, an indication of kind of the struggles um, experienced by the print industry, not only in South Africa, but around the world. Cosmo was first published in South Africa in 1984. So that was 36 years of publishing. Of course, you're all probably quite familiar with the brand. It's a global brand. They're, it's syndicated around the world. Um, and it, 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 it glocalizes itself, right? So it brings in the, the global media discourse of the Cosmopolitan brand, but then tries to translate it in ways that are relevant uh, to local readerships. And Cosmopolitan South Africa was no different. Um, they came to have an audience of almost 2 million readers every month. Um, so even though they no longer exist, I think um, it's, they're an interesting case study, of course, um, in terms of consumer culture in South Africa and the um, localizing of this global narrative of femininity, which I'm sure you're all quite familiar with from the cosmos in your own countries. Um, so what I wanted to explore in my chapter was to really think about what kind of aesthetic is being created here and what kind of um, narratives about empowerment are being suggested through this image. Um, so the main argument that I make in the chapter is that this image represents an attempt by the mainstream commercial media industry to appropriate some of the sensibilities and communicative power of the selfie. Um, as, colleagues show in other chapters uh, in the book, you know, the selfie really is, is held up and admired as this, um, this form of expression through which people can control their own narratives about who they are and where they fit in and how they are present in their complex lives and in their societies. And I found it quite interesting that this, this very political notion of legitimacy, of presence, of, of um, visibility, which the selfie um, uh, displays when used by anyone else in any other setting, right, is being attempted to be captured by Cosmopolitan to say something about their brand and their relevance to millennials and in the social media age. Um, so there's... So I explore the composition of the image, the way it's framed. Um, I ask questions about whether it was posed or whether it was genuinely a selfie. And I don't think we can tell that just from looking at the image. Um, you'll notice that Michlali Ndamase, the influencer in the middle of the image is holding a, a little remote control with a button connected to a shutter release cable. So that's the only indication I would argue that this image was actually taken by the people in the image. Other than that, it very much um, checks the boxes of a glossy commercial magazine cover style. Um, you can tell that the three women in the picture are highly stylized, that they were hairstylists and makeup artists and you know, fashion stylists all involved in the production of the look and the feel and the style of the image. So it really raises that question of, well, what then is a selfie if 
cosmopolitan and the mainstream commercial media industry says it's only got to do with the pressing of the button. You know, what about all of the other aesthetic choices about self-representation that everyone else makes when they take a selfie, right? So uh, questions like that are, are what I explore. And then politically, um, I guess really the, you know, the whole scholarship on selfies often comes down to a question of power and empowerment. You know, who, who gets to be in charge of how they are represented? And we've, we all got really excited about selfies because we're, we felt that this was an example of um, people being able to control their own narratives and present themselves in their own ways. Um, and something different is happening here because even though these influencers um, created careers for themselves through selfie taking and sharing on their own individual uh, social media platforms, uh, we need to ask how empowered they actually are in this particular image and what it means that a very powerful global brand is um, attempting to use their empowerment to uh, kind of shore up their own legitimacy. Um, so, you know, a, a surface reading of this image is that it's, it's a print media brand that is on the way out, that is falling apart, quite literally in South Africa it already has, print industries are struggling everywhere, and there is this just a way of trying to show relevance um, in a social media age, um, or is it a, a genuine um, offer of a, a platform to people who have achieved that Insta fame um, in their own rights through other platforms. So I think, so I call this kind of image, I, I, I tried to coin a, a new term or a new name for this genre of selfie, and I call it the professional selfie because it kind of merges the glamour photography, high production values of the glossy magazine cover with the, the spirit or the ethic of self-representation and controlling the narrative, especially um, by young people. Um, and I think what the professional selfie are, allows us to think further about, and this is something for future research, for other researchers to explore, not only me, but is what this means in relation to neoliberal subjectivity, in relation to the ways in which mainstream powerful media brands appropriate and uh, try to commodify subcultural visual movements and practices. Um, and I also think it raises questions about how we, we continue to define and redefine selfies and what they are and how they get used and appropriated and deployed in different ways outside of the quite, I think, inspiring sensibility of each person being able to tell their story on their terms in their ways on their own platforms. Um, and I think something different is happening now that selfies have become so mainstreamed and, and so much um, a, a part of media culture beyond just the individual social media pages and platforms. I think my time's up, so I'll stop there. Thank you. I'm just gonna jump in as a presenter myself and talk a little bit about uh, the chapter that I've included uh, that looks at the work of Travis Alabanza. And I'm just gonna read a little bit um, of some different excerpts from my chapter. So in an image posted on their Instagram feed on the 13th of January, 2020, Travis Alabanza appears wearing a dark pinstriped blazer open in the front over a lacy red, black, red and black bra and dark high-waisted pinstriped suit bottoms. Their hair is straight and long, a gold hoop earring catches the side light coming from what might be a nearby window. They lean back toward the bare white wall behind them in a slight, slightly sultry pose, lips pursed, cat eyes looking directly at us through the picture plane. Alabanza is mobilizing a sophisticated and sexy version of themselves a non-binary femness unabashedly wearing a bra while having a slightly hairy chest. They take up the central location in the frame, cropped at the hips with a small amount of negative space above their head, frontal facing and shallow pictorial space. The framing frontality and composition of the image references the aesthetics of a long tradition of Western portraiture, traceable back to the 16th century. However, here, the aesthetics of the image maker slash subject are a radical intervention into the visual field. 
rather than assist Caucasian man self-imaging via entrenched art historical materials, Alabanza disrupts aesthetics and media-based hierarchies and traditions of self-portraiture. Alabanza's appropriate pronouns are the singular uses of they, them, theirs, and Black British refers to British citizens of either indigenous African descent or of Black Afro-Caribbean or Afro-Caribbean background, and includes people with mixed ancestry as well. Uh, these are terms uh, by which Travis Alabanza self-identifies. Non-binary, of course, refers to someone who does not identify with the gender binary, and trans, uh, trans femme is used in my chapter uh, to differentiate trans women um, and trans femme recognizes that gender is a free signifier, not essentialized nor reductively attached to any gender or biological sex, but rather is about aesthetics and gestures. So that was a little side and uh, back to Travis. Predominantly known for their work and performance, Black British non-binary trans femme artist Travis Alabanza grew up in working class Bristol, England, and is currently based in London and is active in the performance and theater scenes. Uh, in 2017, Alabanza became the youngest recipient of the artists in residence at the Tate Workshop Program. And they've performed in venues such as the ICA, the Roundhouse, the Barbican, um, and they've toured throughout Europe and the United States. Uh, and using the platform of Instagram, Alabanza inserts a radical aesthetic into the visual field, critically engaging in discourses of trans identity formations, photography, and representation. Blurring distinctions between self-portraiture and selfies, the use of Instagram by image makers like Alabanza mobilizes the platform as an ever-evolving self-curated solo exhibition of self-portraiture. This not only presents a challenge to how we think of and define portraiture and photographic practice, but also confounds the ways in which stereotypes of marginalized constituencies are established. So rather than creating a static and reductive representation that would narrowly demonstrate an essentialized way of being an acceptable trans subject, Alabanza's self-representations present a diversity of potential ways of being non-binary and Black British while the specifics of Instagram also facilitate that they speak for themselves. Through their mobilization of self-image and text, Alabanza invites us to reconsider how we conceive of gender and trans identities, specifically taking on the narrative of that trans folks um, that was established when media originally spectacularized trans people and the psychiatric and medical industries pathologized trans people um, and what's been pe uh, perpetuated by mainstream media, um, which is a history that suggests that a trans person is sort of trapped in the wrong body, uh, one of two types of bodies, and that they must transition as quickly as possible into the other type to, quote, feel like themselves. Um, and this reductive narrative really reinvests in the gender binary and effectively uh, works to erase all who exist outside of or between masculine and feminine. And Alabanza's oeuvre prompts questions about how we assign gender qualities to aesthetics. And they don't offer any easy answers, um, but you know, they will often use um, the captions to sort of speak to these ideas. And as a poet and a performer, Alabanza is really good in mobilizing both image and text. Um, so what we see here in the caption beside the image is when I told you I was not a man, it was not just reacting to a feeling, your touch, an act of self-defiance, but was also a choice in deciding that I am allowed to have ownership over my body and its history. People want a story that says, I always knew it was innate. I could not live another way. And although true for some, why must we have always known to now decide that we want more? When I say trans, I mean escape. Alabanza's selfie work is an imperative and complex representation that defies the stereotypes and erasures of such constituencies produced by dominant culture, while simultaneously challenging our previously held conceptions of photography and self-portraiture. To understand the nuances and intervention of Alabanza's self-images, 
This chapter models a trans visual studies approach in which methods of analysis are co-informed by the object of study. Alabanza's work unfixes the photograph, breaking open the space between looking at a surface of a picture and the person referenced by the image. Simultaneously, Alabanza's interest in surface is not superficial. The images seem to encourage us to view aesthetics as being about communication, identity, play, performativity, and in discourse with numerous visual languages and aesthetics, including gender, racialization, class, and subculture affiliations. And I'll pause it there and leave that as my teaser for my chapter. Thank you. So I think that um, concludes our uh, lovely, wonderful, uh, very teaserly teasers for these chapters today. Um, and so I hope that everybody's really interested to, to read more. So again, thank you everybody so much for your awesome presentations. Um, fantastic. Uh, so here's my, my first question um, to get us rolling. So um, I just want to say the book project has been really inspiring uh, to me for many reasons. Um, I generally feel that it's pushing the discussion on self-representation in an expanded sense in really important directions by bringing together all of these diverse approaches and perspectives. Um, and uh, I think we really could see that in everybody's uh, great presentations, um, really diverse and really thoughtful and nuanced takes on self-representation in this expanded field. But I just wanted the first question to give everyone an opportunity um, to talk a little bit more about how you arrived at um, writing your chapters. Like, what was it? And you all talked about this a little bit, but if you could say a little bit more about what drove you to this particular object of study or case study or sort of your approach uh, to this chapter, what, what drew you to writing this, the chapters that you did? I can jump. Um... Just Thanks, yeah, um, you know, just real quickly, I'm I'm uh, I, I guess it's somewhat unconventional, but I've uh, you know included myself as a subject, but that's I guess uh, meta <clears throat> for the idea of uh, selfies and self portraiture. Um, you know, I, I the project itself, um, the self portraiture project itself was in for me an investigation of. Um, identity and performance. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the telling of the story that came out and through the, the paper itself, um, it, it was, was really about, um, I guess, uh, positioning um, those, those, pra so a bit of nostalgia there, but positioning those, those practices that that were happening at that time as um, um, without making um, huge historical claims, but um, as an important part of of the way that um, the the Web 2.0 and um, social media landscapes um, evolved. Um, as, as somebody who teaches um, uh, um, internet culture and and um, Photojournalism. I, you know, I was, I was really interested. I guess it, in this notion and idea that the um, sort of the history of photography and the history of not just self representation but all representation using uh, imaging technology is a kind of um, uh, not just stories about technical advancements because I think that that clouds it, but um, the the other to, to turn that inside out to say that the history of uh, these um, imaging technologies is the history of, of how our society uh, comes to terms with uh, major issues, uh, confronts them, and uh, moves forward through progress. My my way into this chapter was not as um, as lofty, <laughs> but um, it. I am thinking through the interconnection between mechanics and methodologies of institutions um, and how they create the history of photography as we know it, um, and particularly the role of race in that. Um, and so for this chapter, I was able um, to think about these ideas that come from 
outside of the history of photography, which for various reasons has been historiographically rather insulated, ironically, <laughs> um, and um, put them in conversation with theories coming from other disciplines and show that they're at the, the center of the, this very photographic space, this claim being made in the center of this space. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that opportunity. Well, for me, oh, sorry. No, you go first, Tina. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, uh, this uh, chapter on um, webcam art, this is part of my PhD the thesis that I'm currently writing, which is about artistic self-representation in the digital mm -hmm. age and actually traces back self-representation uh, to the Renaissance and um, researching how the functions and themes of self-representation have changed. Um, over the centuries and then especially with the entrance uh, into the digital age and how digital artists now have maybe different motives or themes in their self-portraiture or self-representation. So, and the webcam, especially, I, I figured it was like a really crucial part when it, when it comes to um, self-representation. And one discussion that always strikes me is the discussion about narcissism and selfies, which is negatively connotated very much when it comes to female self-representation. And I, for me, it is, um, uh, it is more of um, a technological development that actually enabled our selfie culture today, because um, from a historical perspective, um, it was people were always interested in depicting themselves in the pictures, but they didn't have the ability to do so. For example, the mirror was a really big invention, which enabled during the Renaissance the possibility of really uh, displaying yourself more individually and really seeing your face better than in any other medium, like in water, for example. Well, and so also with the invention of photography, the main part were um, photo, um, portraiture studios when photography came into existence. And nowadays it's also the shift from the family camera to the individual camera, to the smartphone, to the phone facing camera, to the immediately being able to see the images when you after you took them, plus the possibility to, to directly up upload them to the internet that of course technological enables selfie culture, but um, it has nothing to do for me personally, that um, it's a kind of cultural shift. It's a very, or well, it's a cultural shift um, enabled by technology. And the uh, webcam <laughs> was kind of the first tool that uh, really, uh, um, had the ability for people to put their visual appearance online and stream it live because the internet in the 90s was, as I said, text-based and also early chat rooms like the MUDs, they have been text-based and also the appearance was uh, described by, uh, with words, it was not displayed. So that is why the webcam is such a crucial invention when it comes to self-representation for me. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I'm really enjoying hearing um, from the visual art analysts, their takes on self-representations and the different technological forms. Um, and it strikes me like how, how different it is really to commercial forms of representation, right? Which is really what I've written about for a big part of my academic career. Um, I started writing about magazine covers and then I moved, you know, and part of that was thinking about portraiture, of course, and then I moved on to thinking about selfies as a new kind of portraiture. And then I started looking into influences and I'm still, you know, analyzing data from, uh, from a, a, a research project about influences. And then I came across this magazine cover, which somehow seemed to bring all of those empirical objects together into this like mashup of a, of an item. Um, and I thought it was a really bold claim made by this brand that they had produced a selfie. And I was like, is it that they don't understand what selfies are? Or, or is it that we don't understand what selfies are, <laughs> right? Um, so that's, that's kind of what got me wanting to write about that. I thought it'd be a nice opportunity to push forward a little bit of my other thinking in terms of uh, the you know, mediation of consumerist discourses on the magazine cover as a genre. Um, and thinking about selfies and seeing the two come together in quite an interesting way. Um, but one thing that's kind of popped into my head listening to the, the artists and the art historians and analysts here is, 
you know, is this just another example of that long history of commerce appropriating artistic styles of communication and representation? Because we see all the artists doing really innovative things with the new technologies and, you know, re-igniting um, practices of self-representation through these different technologies, through all the case studies that you've all presented, and they're politically significant in multiple ways. Um, it is the end point always that some powerful commercial brand will borrow or use or steal or appropriate those sensibilities in order to, you know, sell themselves and their products and their brands? Um, or is it, you know, the reverse happening that more and more people are starting to internalize the logic of the brand and of the neoliberal self in order to be successful in this world in which if you don't self-brand and you don't take selfies and present yourself in this glossy kind of thoughtful artistic sometimes way that you don't have a chance of making it. So I'd love to hear what others think about that in terms of the commerce and art relationship. Mark, I see you have your hand up, yes. Thank you, Ace. <laughs> um, and now I don't know how to lower my hand. There we go, I did it. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it's, um, it, it is, it is fascinating to, to, to think about how, especially the, uh, all of us who are here right now are, are sort of um, connecting and linking, you know, the, the stories uh, with each other. But um, Mahita, I, I was, you know, I was, I, I was listening to your first intro, you, I think that you posed a question, and I think that uh, you reposed it, um, just now to us. Um, so I, I'm just going to say it back um, just to see if I'm thinking about this. But the, the question that I had and the question that I think that you're asking is how empowered are people in their self-portraiture when the platforms uh, that we are sharing and participating in are controlled by these um, you know, as, as you you say, neoliberal uh, capitalist uh, e experiments, um, so that you know, on Instagram, it's it's very, uh, you know, there's a there's a kind of narrow way in which you can present your body, or else your account uh, uh, gets gets um, shut down. Um, that 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 you know that's so for me that's that's the the question that I think. Um, is maybe attached to the to the the lofty and the the future facing one, um, but um, um, uh, Tina and, um, uh, and 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 Natalie too. I, I was you know I was also thinking about um, this idea of the technology and the the front facing cameras and um, re related to what I would call the Mahita question is. Um, you know, the, the chicken and egg proposition, um, was it that the technology made it possible for us to do this? Or were there artists who were uh, kind of pushing, and this is a little bit of what I try to, to get at. Um, so were there artists kind of with various practices um, showing people, other artists and, you know, uh, commercial and technical entrepreneurs that there would be a market for um, you know, webcams or front-facing uh, cell phones. If only, you know, they designed it and put put products out there, we could, you know, create something. So there, there's a bit of a kind of uh, tension between the determinist and instrumentalist um, question. I'm, I'm just throwing, throwing that back out there too. We do have a question in the Q&A place. I'll, I'll uh, just read out the question quickly if you want to. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, an anonymous attendee um, is asking everyone, um, I would be interested to hear more about the context of the artist referenced by all presenters. Do you believe they are oracles from the past about the physical space in which we experience visual art? And must it occur in a space designated for art? And then specifically, I would, I would ask of Tina and her exhibition, Spec Speculative Cultures in NYC, which they saw, um, how did you find the gallery function for this exhibition? Uh, go ahead, Tina. Uh, yeah, no, actually, I, Natalie, please go ahead. I, I... I will try to bridge both questions in this answer. Um, and 
um, because I think Thomas does it for us in Aperture a little bit, right? Um, part of one of the other reasons this Muse exhibition is so interesting is it came along with a book, which is a major part of Aperture's uh, foundation's programming, this long-term publishing arm from the early 50s, um, a monograph. And um, it, the, it's notable because hers, um, like up until 2014, Aperture had published four monographs of work by US-based artists of African descent since 1952. And um, by the time Thomas's exhibition was in program, she was the second in months. And since then they've gone on to publish at least um, eight. Uh, so like that it was indicative of a radical uh, shift in their focus and resources. Um, but rather than sort of singularly putting that monograph forward of her work, she showed that there were all these people who had not been acknowledged working. I mean, that Renee Cox photographs from 1993. So um, she refused to enter that space without proof of the legacy that had been ignored um, by that institution prior to her arrival. Um, so like the novelty of the technology for, sh for sure, right? The, the flip the lens icon on your iPhone. Um, but what Thomas does in that exhibition is stake a claim about the history of artists working for decades prior to that exhibition, um, interrogating questions of self-representation and the photograph also. Um, so I don't think she's an oracle, <laughs> but the gallery space is charged with lots of meaning. And she, um, that exhibition approaches it with an understanding of that. Yeah, thank you, Natalie, also. And thank you for this uh, really interesting questions. For me personally, I also don't think artists, or generally, I don't think of artists as like oracles, but of um, individuals who carefully reflect their own time and therefore have a sense of, you know, understanding, phrasing, with words visually, however, what happens in a society right now, and therefore, of course, uh, contribute largely to a discussion on um, of these aspects. And well, one important point of the internet and the art there is, of course, that it is not an art space. So all the artists I also introduced, they present um, their work um, on on their own websites and on social media. So all art online presented. Now it changed a little, but basically it's not presented on designated art spaces, which of course changes the whole perception of art and the notion of what is art, what is pop culture, and the whole visual languages, of course, melt and merge into each other. So it's often difficult to, to understand the differences, as maybe we have seen with Amalia Ullman's performance, excellences and perfections. And um, but I also think that the physical space and the virtual space, they mix with with each other actually and they're really important and Natalie addressed uh, Rene Cox uh, two times which I, is also an artist I admire and I also write about in my thesis um, where she put herself so she's a um, black American artist putting herself in a series as an alter ego Raje she's called um, into real life settings right into uh, settings of the Times Square or Uncle Ben's rice packages and always questioning these notions of culture, but still uh, doing this online as well as offline. And she's a very perfect and early example of how these two worlds um, merge and how she contrib highly contributed to this discussion of um, several presentation online and offline. And sorry, maybe just a little more word to because my show was addressed in um, Speculative Cultures show. Thank you so much for um, visiting the show and bringing this up. The show was not about self-representation, but about it was a virtual reality show and all the virtual reality works have been embedded in physical installations by the same artist. And the show addressed a similar topic of how how the artists they all address different cultures in the virtual reality artworks like ancient cultures ancient Egypt cultures um, Persian cultures for example and but also contemporary cultures around the world and they all had to find ways of addressing this topic also in a physical space which is kind of still the, the social space where we all meet and um, so it is always important to yeah take both spaces into consideration um, 
yeah, sorry, <laughs> I lost thread, I think, um, when it comes to discussion of um, the topics such as also, of course, self-representation. Thank you. So many amazing questions and comments. I love the conversation that we're getting to have, and I don't have really a concise point to make, but um, some of the interesting things that I think are coming up are really about sort of, you know, the the really complex uh, field of self-representation and, you know, thinking about the different like histories that uh, selfies and social media sort of intervene in, you know, Tina, you were mentioning like the, the long traditions of self-portraiture and how webcams become a new uh, invention. It sort of made me think a little bit about the history of photography and how you know, when photography sort of emerged, it disrupted so many things, but it was also at the nexus of like creativity and science, much the way that, you know, the, the internet has been. It's like the nexus of like scientific research and creative impulses. And so it, it sort of bridges back into, you know, some of the earlier questions too about how these things are going to be used and mobilized um, and kind of the blurriness between these boundaries, it's like, it's really always kind of contingent on each kind of case study. Like some artists are gonna use social media to like radical, interesting, disruptive ends, you know, just the way that early photographers, you know, did like Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass were using like carte de visites to like take down, you know, people being enslaved. So like, there's always gonna be those disruptors that use the new media, but then there's always gonna be, you know, uh, global capitalism trying to like uh, take it back and then also try and marginalize those radical voices with terms like narcissistic, which is just used to discredit like those radical interventions, which of course is hugely problematic and there's a whole discourse and we could get into that. But anyway, I'll stop talking for a minute, yeah. but there's just so much happening. <laughs> Tina, yeah, but, sorry, but it's <laughs> such an interesting point you made because the journal Truth, uh, Cut the Visit from the 1870s, I think, or the whole Cut, the, it's like the early, let's call it business cards, Cut the Visit um, system, which original was to hand it to persons for in your own surroundings it was a communication tool between your network right and then mm -hmm. it was actually also commodified uh and sold so so John Drews also sold her business the her cut the seat to make money out of it and to pursue her ideals and um and but other like stars back then they got really paid to make this card these with the receipts and people collected them and bought them and put them in the photo album so it was mm -hmm. a very a commodification also of this early photography mm. tool and now that i <laughs> have the word i also want to uh, make uh, want to say something about Nikita's, um contribution because like one thing about the selfie and the empowering thing about the selfie is that actually for women they can finally you know take their own produce their own image of their own work because historically men had been shaping the image of women in art history mm. and the fact that Michlali says um, in her words uh, like in the text uh, that's the first selfie on the cover of whatever and guess guess who's on it she says you know she didn't say guess who made it you know it's mm. she takes on this role of not being the producer of it but just being part of this commodification and I find mm -hmm. this such an interesting um, point of of your um, work so yeah thank you yeah exactly like all of these young women who are um, trying to be be and become influencers, which is really just a strategy of self-branding and and claiming visibility in order to find legitimacy within a profit-oriented commercial media space. And you know, in the South African context, I could, you know, just to to perhaps disrupt an idea of these influencers as like narcissistic, frivolous, kind of silly, <laughs> shallow, materialistic, etc. You know, in a context of youth unemployment of almost 40% in South Africa and, um, you know, failing social welfare structures and infrastructures and services, it's like there are not that many options for young people um, in terms of income generation, in terms of career paths. And a lot of these influences, I think, are very cleverly and savvily finding 
a route to both economic and kind of cultural empowerment through self-representation um, online. And actually this Cosmo cover is evidence of that because they crossed over, right? From just being big on Instagram or big on YouTube to being on the cover of one of the biggest glossy magazines in the country where normally only celebrities and beauty queens, et cetera, are recognized and are paid to. So there is something definitely empowering happening, but it's a narrow definition of empowerment because it's, it's you know, they have to present in a particular way. They have to look the part. They have to be the Cosmo girl in order to get on the cover. So we could ask the question, you know, if they were just performing Cosmo girl ness in their social media presences um so who was influencing who and who is you know being influenced by what structures of power um and what discourses of success femininity aspiration success i think they are all quite embedded one into the other but i mean i wrote this chapter before cosmo fell apart in south africa so that also says something like this brand doesn't exist here anymore so I'm not sure who's winning and who's losing. I thought it was so astute uh, to, to bring up uh, Carte de Visite because um, what, a, what a great analog to, to Instagram, you know, uh, the, the Carte de Visite is to, you know, to follow someone, uh, is to receive their, their card. Um, Mahita, on, your, on that Cosmo cover, I'll call it your Cosmo cover. <laughs> three steps to make bank on Insta. Um, and so I, you know, I want to open it and I want to find out how I can make bank too. But, <laughs> I, but, but I think th that, um, you know, Ace, you just, you described, um, you know, the, the, the cultural, uh, the technical, um, Tina, you also as well, but there is this, this commercial, um, I, you know, I suppose it, we shouldn't think of it as binary, um, that it's either commercial or non-commercial. Um, and Mahita, what you were just describing is this, um, the kind of need to survive, uh, you know, uh, necessity being uh, the, the mother of invention here that, um, that uh, these con digital content creators uh, or influencers are doing what they do uh, as a way of adapting and surviving in the in the market in the marketplace. Um, I wanted to mention quickly back to this idea of narcissism, um, because it does come up so much around selfies as a way to dismiss uh, selfie mm -hmm. makers is um, Ray uh, Chow, postcolonial scholar not writing about selfies talks about narcissism in one point and uh, really describes it as sort of like the dominant culture, um, really trying to actively dismiss uh, the work of folks that are doing something that is taking power away from that dominant uh, power holding regime, basically. Um, and again, not writing about selfies, but I think, you know, to, to throw that out there too, I think it's like, that's exactly what that is. It's using uh, this term that um, has all types of connotations and all sorts of like mm. historical connotations, like a way of dismissing queer people for, you know, a narcissistic disorder, a way for dismissing, you know, femme people for caring too much about how they appear in, in a culture that like, you know, puts that <laughs> on everyone. So um, I think there's a lot of complexity to the, the precision of, of mobilizing that term. And I think, you know, thinking about Ray's, Ray Chow's um, calling it out um, and sort of saying, no, that's actually a term that's particularly used to dismiss certain types of people when they begin to have agency. So just to go back to that. But again, I think it's complicated, but yeah. But, but, but simple uh, also because we see it, uh, you know, as a used as a tool of, uh, you know, fascism or, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, supremacy to, to, call, to call out difference and say, no, you're different, that's bad, conform or cease to exist, or we will, you know, threat, threaten your life in that, in that way, your life or your livelihood. Um, so that's, um, who, who is the scholar, Ace? Oh, Ray Chow. Ray Chow, okay, that's, mm -hmm. that's great, I want to look at that.
Yeah, yeah. I have to remember exactly where I found it, but at least in this mm. context, I can just mm. <laughs> sprinkle mm. it out there. The other thing I wanted to just mention quickly too is what I find particularly fascinating about the use of a platform like social media and you know something that I'm interested in looking at the work of uh, Travis Alavanza in particular, but the way that you like, if you're mobilizing that platform, uh, one can have sort of countless images that like just go on uh, forever and you can post as frequently as you like um, and that it really disrupts sort of two things mm -hmm. like the art world star system mm -hmm. or who makes it on that cover of that magazine. Um, but then also it really kind of disrupts how we think about photography and the way that stereotypes of people are created with sort of that one iconic photograph and then the attachment of all these problematic ideas to that photograph. Mm -hmm. So when you are able to have multiple images um, of oneself, different versions of oneself, you're able to sort of create this really expansive uh, self-portrait mm -hmm. that's like always uh, fluctuating, uncontainable, uh, mm -hmm. ever augmenting. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm curious if that strikes anybody in an interesting way too, because that's one mm -hmm. thing that I, I get excited about when I go looking for cool mm -hmm. things happening on Instagram and I, I see that. <laughs> I, I mean, not to be too, too kind of binary in my thinking, but I feel like the artists do that, the creatives do that with social media, but then the influencers, those who, you know, want to be mainstream successes and make money and be associated with brands and, you know, do not actually have a multifaceted way of showing themselves. You know, they curate, I've been doing some interviews with, with some influencers and one of my PhD students is doing a whole study on, on influencers and I was really struck by how carefully they produce the aesthetic that they show on their social media pages and they actually limit what they show. They don't show all of the, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, the exciting, the thrilling, the weird, the all of the different, they just show this one really glossy, quite, um, I think glossy is the best word for it, um, version of themselves, which actually is very magazine-like, you know? So it's like, which came first again? Um, but that, that's why it's so exciting to see what artists are doing with self-representation because the artists are always doing the transgressive, the rebellious, the, um, you know, the experimental things first. Um, and that's really, I think, where the mo most potential lies for kind of pushing back against structures of power through social media and self-representation is in the creative and the artistic forms of expression that are exactly as Ace just described them. Um, as like augmenting and constantly developing. And that's really exciting. But I do sometimes get a bit, when I look at different influences, you know, perfectly curated grids and perfect lighting. And I know that there are people in the background holding up lights and doing makeup. And, um, and there's a lot of that on social media and it seems to be also growing and expanding. Yeah, very much. I think it's 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 really important to pay attention to the different approaches, right? That influencers use selfies to become popular. Obviously, that's the goal of of being an influencer. But for artists, artists don't make selfies. They use selfies as an artistic tool to reflect on our society, and that's a crucial point that often is overlooked by. Also by art historians who deal with selfies, they mix pop culture with um, this kind of artistic reflection. And that's also one point why I'm writing this thesis because I want to make these differences also mm -hmm. very clear because they are really relevant, I think. And to give an example of an artist and influencer is Avida Baiström. Uh, she's an artist who is an influencer, but also an artist. And she um, is very popular. She gets like, makes ads for Adidas and for popular brands. And she became, a, she is very famous on, on, on social media, on Instagram, but she also made a picture um, for, I think it was Adidas or a sports brand where she displays herself with um, hairs, with pubic hairs under the arms mm -hmm. and unshaved legs. And because she, she makes her thing as an artist and as an influencer and she, made it somehow possible to create it, a brand that exists that is successful commercially but also in the art scene and she's a really really interesting example of 
being reflective and pushing also the boundaries of, for, for example, Instagram guidelines because her photos often get deleted also. They made a whole book on pics or it's called Pics or Didn't Happen, a book where they collect all the pictures that have been banned from Instagram because they don't fit to the guidelines. So um, this is, it's a great book. And she's a really interesting example it's about like this being successful in the arts or and commercially. Whereas also the art worlds, there are people in the art world obviously who see this critically. If someone is an artist and an influencer, it doesn't fit to the minds of many art historians also, but luckily into mine. And she's a really great, um, interesting person. Mm. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that great share. I'm just, I, I've been getting so excited about our conversation, but I'm also um, being mindful of uh, the time and everyone's time. So I think it's uh, just about time to wrap up unless anyone has one kind of last burning uh, question or, or comment. Well, officially, um, thank you to everyone who's presented today and been so generous uh, with your chapters, with your research, with your talking, with your chatting. It's been uh, super excellent to get to talk with everyone and hear more about what y'all are up to and to, to see your faces. I wish it could be in real life and I could, you know, high five us all, give hey. hugs. So we take the <laughs> selfie, right? Eh? So take yeah, the selfie, yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> Uh, and thank you so much for everyone for coming. Um, and thank you everyone uh, at MDPI for putting everything together. But um, yeah, before the panelists leave, we're going to take a selfie. But um, everyone else, uh, thanks for listening and joining us and check out the book. Um, yeah, it's great. It is great. <laughs> it's also it's really awesome. cool that it's open access. That's just fantastic. And I hope yeah, lots of people download it. So liberatory of us all <laughs> let's see do we want to get uh oliva and and charlotte do you guys want to be in yeah. a selfie please yeah they should sure. be yeah. thanks <laughs> yes i mean good question doesn't even count as a selfie i don't even know <laughs> it's a new yeah, genre of selfies screenshot yeah. selfies <laughs> all right everyone ready yes, yes. Ready. one two three Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.